In this example, I'm going to use Monte Carlo simulation to value a fictitious equity. I'm going to plot the distribution of our intrinsic values, and then finally I'm going to compare the intrinsic value to the market value and determine whether this stock is likely undervalued, overvalued, or appropriately valued. Okay, so I've built this two-stage DCF model, and this is a modified version of the DCF model I've used in some of my past videos. Notice here that I have some historical values. I also have some input data, so these are forecasts that I've input. It's essentially our, our best estimate, so we have items like the weighted average cost of capital, the long-term growth rate, G, and other items that I've forecasted, so a tax rate of 20%, etc. Down here in orange, we have our pro forma financial statements, or rather the components that I've calculated using the percent of sales approach to estimate our free cash flows to the firm. Now notice here that I'm using the one of the standard FCFF formulas to calculate our free cash flows to the firm over the next five years. And then in year five or after year five, I assume that our cash flows or free cash flows grow at a constant 2.5% rate and we discount them at the weighted average cost of capital. To calculate our intrinsic value of this equity, I'm using the NPV formula and summing up or rather summing up my, my free cash flows in the final period and then using the NPV formula on the on all five years worth of data. This gives me my intrinsic enterprise value, and from that I subtract the debt, add the cash, and that'll give me my intrinsic market cap, divide by shares outstanding, and that gives me an intrinsic value of the equity per share, which I link up here. And I can compare that to the current share price. Now, let's say I'm not entirely sure that the appropriate weighted average cost of capital or the appropriate growth rate are... 8.25% and 2.5%. Well, here is a perfect example when I might want to use Monte Carlo simulation. And to make this simple, I'm only going to use these two variables or allow these two variables to adjust, and I'm not going to assume any correlation between the values of these. So these two variables are random variables and they are independent of one another. Now, if I want to estimate the probability distribution of each of these random variables, I could do several things. I could uh, forecast them directly, or better yet, if I knew the historical values of our weighted average cost of capital and our long-term growth rate, I could just look at those. So here, I've calculated or I've put together the historical values for our weighted average cost of capital for this firm and our mean estimated long-term growth rate for this firm. And our means of each of these are 8.3% and 2.5%. Standard deviation it, for each of these is listed here. And if I wanted to, to, just to determine the probability distribution of these two variables, I could put together a histogram of each. And that's exactly what I've done here. Now notice here that the value of our weighted average cost of capital at the end of each year it, although we only have 21 observations, it does appear that most observations are clustered around, oh, 7.6% and, oh, 8.6%. So we do see something like a bell curve similar to what we'd see with a normal distribution. This makes me confident or less uncertain about using the normal distribution to simulate my, my uh, values for the weighted average cost of capital. And down here... I've created another histogram for the long-term growth rate. And notice again, we do see some uh, clustering in the center here. I'm gonna go ahead and use the normal distribution here and use these two values as my mean and standard deviation for the long-term growth rate. Now, how do we put these into the model? Well, we make some modifications to the base model. So notice here that I've put together a cell for the standard deviation of the WAC and the growth rate, and I have a simulated value of the WAC and the growth rate here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this cell or these two cells to generate my random variable or my, my simulated values for each of these random variables. So I'm going to change my 
point estimates or my, my means to 8.3, and I'm going to keep the 2.5% for the growth rate. So I've already done that here. I'm going to let my standard deviation for my WAC be this. So I'll paste that value. And I'm going to let my standard deviation for my growth rate be this. And now I can simulate my WAC and my long-term growth rate. So I'll use the norm inv function and use the random variable function in that. So equals normv dot inv. And to get my probability, I'm going to use rand. And rand, it randomly generates a value between 0 and 1 that follows a uniform distribution. So it takes any value between 0 and 1, and each of those values is equally likely. And my mean, I'm going to set equal to the whack. And I'm going to assume that my standard deviation is right here. And there we go, a simulated value of our WAC of 8.7%. And I'll do the same thing for G. All right, there we go. Now, I need to link those values or put those values into my model because right now everything is linking to these values. So what I'm going to do is make changes in the two cells that actually draw on the weighted average cost of capital and the long-term growth rate. And the first of these is in the terminal value. So I'm just going to change all of these to the simulated value of the growth rate and the weighted average cost of capital. Next, I'm going to change the cell that we use to calculate the NPV. I'm going to move that from the weighted average cost of capital from the mean estimate to the simulated value. And now, notice here that my intrinsic value changed, and every time I open and close a cell, my simulated values for the WAC and the G are going to change, and that'll change my free cash flows to the firm, or my intrinsic value using FCFFs. There we go. All right, now we need to generate some trial data. Now, if we had a, a proprietary add-on like at risk, we could do this several other ways. But here, because I'm just using the base version of Excel, I've already created some trials here. And I'm just going to generate some values for each of these trials using the data table function. So to get this, I'm going to link my intrinsic value right here. And then I'm going to simulate the remaining values below this. So here we go. Next, I'm going to highlight all of my possible trials. And I put in a 1,000 of these. And you could do 1,000, you could do 5,000, you could do 500. 10,000 seems to be the standard. I mean, I, I try to use 10,000 if I can. Uh, so here we go. Now let's populate this. And I'm going to go up to the Data tab, go up to What If Analysis, down to Data Table. And here, all we want is to fill in these values with a different intrinsic value. And what I'll do is I will link this column input somewhere anywhere over here. I just need to fill in this data table. So I'll do this. And there we go. We have simulated an intrinsic value. And for each of these, it's assuming a different weighted average cost of capital and growth rate. And it's using those values plus all of our other inputs and the model to generate an intrinsic value. So there we go. Now, what can we do with this? Well, what we can do with this now is we can build a histogram and look at the distribution of each of these intrinsic values and get a sense of how often our intrinsic value is greater or less than our current share price. So to do that, I'm going to highlight the intrinsic value tab or the intrinsic value row, and I'll scroll all the way down here. And I'll put my histogram way up here. And I'll insert a histogram. And here we go. All right, now 
This is a histogram that can be modified heavily. So what I'll do is I'll rename this, start off. And maybe I want to make the plots or the, the actual columns here a little more granular. So what I could do is I could format my axis, change the bin width. Maybe I want this at, oh, let's say 1 or yeah, we'll say 2. Yeah, we'll keep it at 1. No big deal. And if we want, let's say we have a couple of really outlier observations. What we could do is we could create an overflow bin where each of our uh, – any, any observation that ha that's greater than our overflow gets put into that bin. And right now it's at 117. Yeah, that's fine. Let's keep it there. Or better yet, let's, let's just increase it to 150. Notice here we have a few outlier observations here. All right, and there we go. Now notice here the mode here is right around, oh, 53, 55-ish. Uh, if I am comparing my intrinsic value using this Monte Carlo simulation to my current share price, my current share price is way down here at $45 per share. Based on this analysis and nothing else, uh, I mean, quite frankly, the majority of my probabilities or my, the majority of my outcomes here are above $45 a share. If I didn't want to do any other analysis, if I was very confident in this uh, model, I would conclude that it's very likely that the intrinsic value of this stock is above $45 a share. Now, there's obviously a lot of other analysis we would want to do prior to actually investing, but this does give us a sense of the likelihood that our intrinsic value is above our current share price. So if our, let's say the, the mean here was 56-ish, 57-ish, and 70% or 80% of our observations were above $45 a share. This would indicate that this stock might be undervalued. So there we go. Well, there's a lot of other modifications that can be made here. We can use other statistical programs like Stata or R to complete this process as well. But for a, a basic, very simple Monte Carlo simulation, this will do. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email or call me. And I suppose I'll see you in the next video or in class. Thank you.